Audio Lecture, The Age of Napoleon, 1799 to 1815. Visual. Key concept. Theme. We're going to talk a lot about Napoleon as a paradox, which kind of means a contradiction in and of himself. Napoleon began his reign as an enlightened despot who instituted numerous significant reforms in France. Eventually, his lust for power and conquest led him to overextend his empire, resulting in his ultimate defeat at Waterloo in 1815. Napoleon was both a preserver and a destroyer of the ideals of the French Revolution, and that is the paradox. How does he both preserve some of the ideals of the revolution? Because he is a byproduct of that revolution, but simultaneously destroy other ideals of that revolution. That is why we call him a paradox. Napoleon Bonaparte, born of Italian descent to a Corsican family on the French island of Corsica. He was also a military genius who specialized in artillery. He was an avid child of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And he was associated with the Jacobins, the radical faction during the Revolution, and advanced rapidly in the army due to immigration of aristocratic officers out of the country once things got too hot for them. Eventually, he inspired a divided nation during the Directory period into a united nation, but at the price of individual liberty, thus the paradox of Napoleon, both being a preserver and destroyer of the ideals of the French Revolution. Domestic policies of the consulate period, 1799 to 1804, is where we're going to begin. This is the period where we see a lot of enlightened reform put in place in, during Napoleon's reign in his domestic policies. Napoleon took power on December 25th, Christmas Day, 1799, with the Constitution giving him supreme power. As first consul, he behaved more as an absolute ruler than a revolutionary statesman. He demanded loyalty to the state, he rewarded people with ability, and he created an effective hierarchical bureaucracy to help him rule. Last, he was the last and most eminent of the enlightened despots. So now we're going to start talking about his reforms domestically, what he did for France. First of all, you have to look at the Napoleon Code also known as the Code of Napoleon, or sometimes the, Nut the Napoleonic Code. The Napoleon Code is the first clear and complete, complete codification of French law that we have seen. Now, you talked a lot about codifying laws back um, last year in ninth grade in world history, how important written codes of law were to provide order for society. So the fact that this is the first time that the French laws had actually been updated, making sure that old laws don't um, um, overlap each other or there's not repeated things in the law is pretty significant. And that, of course, this codification of the laws can be seen as a byproduct of the Enlightenment and of the French Revolution itself. This is perhaps the longest lasting legacy of Napoleon's rule. It included a civil code, meaning for um, regular civil life in the cities and in the countryside. It also had a code of criminal procedure and a commercial code and a penal code. Penal code meaning for punishments for crimes. It emphasized the protection of private property mostly above everything. This resulted in a strong central government and an administrative unity. Many achievements of the revolution were made permanent by the Napoleon Code. 
Equality before the law was stressed. No more estates or classes. No more legal classes. No more privileges. No more local liberties. No more hereditary offices, guilds, or manors. It also advocated freedom of religion. The state was secular in character, and it emphasized property rights. It also finally abolished all of the remaining relics or vestiges of serfdom that may have remained in place. Women did gain some inheritance rights with Napoleon's code, but it denied women equal status with men except in those inheritance rights. Women and children were legally dependent on their husband or father under the Napoleon Code. Divorce became harder to obtain than during the revolution. Napoleon did not like divorce, uh, even though he had participated in divorce himself. Uh, he thought that it, was, um, it caused disunity within the family and ultimately disunity within society. Women could not buy or sell property or start a business without the consent of their husbands, but they could inherit that after the death of their husbands or fathers. Income earned by wives went to their husbands. Penalties for adultery were also far more severe for women than they were for men. Now, he also emphasized careers open to talent in his domestic policies. Citizens theoretically were able to rise in government service purely according to their abilities. However, a new imperial nobility was created to reward the most talented generals and officials. Wealth determined status overall because of this. Neither military commissions nor civil offices could be bought or sold, however. So again, you see the paradox that is Napoleon right here in just these few phrases. He granted amnesty, meaning um, he granted kind of you get out of any trouble that you may have caused. Uh, you get a get out of jail free card type of thing. Um, amnesty to about 100,000 emigres in return for a loyalty oath. Emigres, if you recall, are those folks who had left France, mostly nobles who had left France when the revolution began to get radical. They feared for their own lives. So he basically said, you are no longer considered enemies of the state. You may come home um, as long as you swear an oath to me as your leader. Many soon occupied high posts in his expanding state bureaucracy as a result of that. So once again, we have a lot of nobility firmly in the driver's seat in the best positions in the government. Some nobles from foreign countries like Italy, the Netherlands, and Germany also will serve the empire with distinction after Napoleon takes over many territories throughout Europe. The working class movement, the sans culotte that we talked about before, was no longer politically significant. They had lost that significance once the radical phase of the revolution came to a close. Workers actually were even denied the right to form trade unions under Napoleon's code. Religious reforms. We're going to talk about the Concordat of 1801 or the agreement or treaty of 1801 that Napoleon made with the Roman Catholic Church to basically have a compromise with the Roman Catholic Church, uh, making amends, if you will, for some of the things that had happened with the clergy earlier in the revolution. Napoleon had motives for doing this. Peace with the church would weaken its link to monarchists who sought a restoration of the Bourbon dynasty. Religion also would help people accept e economic equalities in French society, he had hoped. 
the provisions of the Concordat of 1801 are such. First of all, the Pope renounced claims over church property that had been seized by people during the Revolution. This meant that all of those who had purchased church lands from the government could keep those lands. The French government had the power to nominate or depose bishops still. That kind of reemphasized that Concordat of Bologna that had been in place since way back with Francis I uh, back in the Renaissance period. In return, priests who had resisted signing the civil constitution of the clergy document would replace those who had sworn an oath to the state. So this means that those that remained loyal to the Pope would get their positions back and those who basically went against the Pope to side with the revolution would lose their positions. The Pope gave up claims to church lands in France wholeheartedly as a result of this. Catholic worship in public was allowed once again. The church seminaries were reopened. It extended legal toleration to Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and even atheists who all received the same civil rights no matter what their religious ideology was. It also replaced the revolutionary calendar that had been imposed by Robespierre and the Jacobins with the Christian calendar once again, which is good because that revolutionary calendar was nothing but confusing. To dispel the notion of an established church, Napoleon put Protestant ministers of all denominations on the state payroll. He also wanted to create financial unity. The Bank of France, that started in 1800, served the interests of the state and financial oligarchy. It was a revived version of one of the banks of the old regime. The government balanced the national budget with this bank. The government also established sound currency and public credit. It was a federal system, much like what Alexander Hamilton had done in um, the United States after the revolution. He also initiated economic reforms to stimulate the economy. Low food prices were guaranteed. This is mercantilism, folks. Uh, it was not supply and demand that would determine the cost of items, of foodstuffs. It was the government. Low unemployment was guaranteed with this. And he also lowered taxes on farmers. He also guaranteed that church lands that had been redistributed during the revolution remained in the hands of the new owners, which were mostly um, upper peasants. He created an independent peasantry that would be the backbone of French, quote, democracy, which really is, you know, un really under an emperor, him. This is what we mean by the paradox. Tax collections became more efficient as well. Workers were not allowed to form guilds or trade unions. That was against the law. And he retained Le Chapelier Law of 1791. Educational reforms were also put in place and they were based on a system of state controlled public education. Rigorous standards um, were put in place, but public education was available to the masses. Secondary and higher education, called lyces, were reorganized to prepare young men for government service and professional occupations. Education became important for social standing and advancement. One system for those who could spend 12 or more years at school one unified universal system. The other was for boys who entered the workforce at the age of 12 or 14. And yet um, Napoleon also sought to increase the, increase the size of the middle class. The creation of a police state, however, was also part of his goals. 
a spy system kept thousands of citizens under continuous surveillance. This were, was seemed like remnants from the old reign of terror radical phase. Again, he enshrined some of the ideals of the revolution and of the enlightenment with equality before the law and economic unity, but also refutes it with these kinds of things, spy system, keeping thousands of citizens under continuous surveillance, whether they were, you know, uh, plotting against the government or not. Big Brother was always watching. After 1810, political suspects were held in state prisons, as they had been during the terror. The government ruthlessly put down opposition, especially guerrilla warfare type people in western provinces of the Vendee and Brittany. These are places that had opposition to the revolution and had been put down mercilessly during the reign of terror. They were ones that had resurfaced and, um, as revolting under Napoleon. Napoleon's most publicly notorious action was the 1804 arrest and execution of a Bourbon, the Duke of Inyon, who had allegedly taken part in a plot against Napoleon. There was no evidence he was involved with the plot, but because he was a cousin of the former monarch, he was considered guilty. European public opinion was livid over this execution. Drawbacks of Napoleon's reforms. There was severe inequality for women. Workers were not allowed to form trade unions, as we said. He repressed liberty, subverted republicanism, and restored absolutism in reality in France through the creation of this police state. He practiced nepotism by placing his own family members on the thrones of all of the nations that he conquered. Key concept. Napoleon's wars during the consulate era are really where he shined. A series of wars were usually short and distinct. Only Britain was at war continually with France at this time. Four great powers, Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia did not fight France simultaneously until 1813. He managed to fight all of them at different times, and that's one of the reasons why France stayed alive through all of the wars of Napoleon. Nations were willing to ally with Napoleon for their own foreign policy benefit against other nations he was fighting, even if later on he would be attacking them. It's just the way things worked out. Only gradually, after Napoleon had conquered Italy, did those nations decide Napoleon had to be defeated for a peaceful Europe to be maintained. Remember, they're always concerned about balance of power. Once Napoleon conquered Italy, they were concerned that the balance of power was shifting too far in the favor of France and Napoleon. The War of the Second Coalition it happened between 1798 and 1801. We start with the Battle of the Nile. This was where Britain's Horatio Nelson destroyed Napoleon's navy. Napoleon was good on land, but not good at sea. And we know that Great Britain has the best navy in the world. Napoleon will blame the Directory for the loss. This is before he took power. Uh, and um, will win public support. He will be able to use that support to help him in his takeover as a result, his coup of 18 Brumaire. Here is a British com cartoon commenting on the Battle of the Nile. Um, it's called the expiration of the plagues of Egypt, the destruction of revolutionary crocodiles, or the British hero cleansing ye mouth of ye Nile. Napoleon was victorious, nevertheless, even with the Egyptian defeat. Let me explain. It led to the Treaty of Luneville, 1801, which ended the Second Coalition against him, against France. Austria lost Italian possessions in the process. German territory 
um, in the west bank of the Rhine was now incorporated into France. So he may have lost the Egyptian defeat, but he ended up winning territory elsewhere because the other parts of the European coalition, the second coalition, um, made a deal with him. Russia also retreated from Western Europe when they saw their ambitions in the Mediterranean blocked by the British. Britain, again, was isolated, even though technically they had won in Egypt. Britain was isolated from any allies. No allies left. Now let's talk about what was going on in Saint-Domingue or Haiti, which was one of France's major colonies in the Caribbean. Napoleon sent a large army to subdue a slave rebellion that was going on there at the, about the same time that this war of the, um, um, of the Second Coalition was ending. Uh, French forces were decimated however, once they arrived in Haiti by disease as well as those slave rebels. Below you see a um, picture of Haitian slave rebels uh, that staged successful revolts for 12 years. These revolts continued and they will not end until 1803. This was a plague on Napoleon's successes that were going on in Europe. While he was being successful in Europe, his, um, his, his armies across the sea were failing in putting down a slave rebellion on a small island. And it was kind of an embarrassment for him. The Haitian forces were led by Toussaint Le Vaucher, who was very much influenced by Enlightenment ideals. Here is a painting of Le Vaucher in a military uniform holding a document. Most people think most likely a, a uh, enlightenment um, writing that he was reading to his people about freedom. The Haitians were motivated by French revolutionary ideals of freedom from absolute rule and natural rights. Ironic, no? Haiti won its independence from France in 1804 largely because Napoleon had to cut his losses. He could no longer afford to keep uh, some of his armies in Haiti fighting a losing battle when he needed them for reinforcements for his victories in Europe. Napoleon ultimately, after pulling out of Haiti, decided that he would also sell the Louisiana territory that still belonged to France that was in North America. He would sell this to the U.S. as his hopes for recreating an American empire were squelched by the Haitian revolt and an impending war with Britain. This is why he had to cut his losses. He had to focus on the war with Britain that was about to recommence. The Empire Period, 1804 to 1815. This will be the last phase for Napoleon. On December 2nd, 1804, Napoleon crowned himself hereditary Emperor of France in Notre Dame Cathedral. He s gave up the title of Consul for life in exchange for Emperor of France. He hoped to preempt plans of royalists that he had heard wanted to bring the Bourbon dynasty back to the throne. There were still members of the Bourbon family living abroad in Europe. He believed that an empire was necessary for France to maintain and expand its influence throughout Europe. What he really wanted was to conquer all of Europe. Napoleon viewed himself as a liberator who freed foreign peoples from the absolute rulers who oppressed them. That's another irony because wasn't he an absolute ruler himself? Yes, but he saw himself as a byproduct of the French Revolution and he saw himself as delivering the revolutionary ideals to other people living under more oppressive absolute rulers, more oppressive than he would be, he thought. So again, the paradox that is Napoleon. 
Here is a uh, portrait, not a portrait, excuse me, a painting of the coronation of Emperor Napoleon I and the coronation of the Empress Josephine, his wife, in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, December 2nd, 1804. This painting is done by Jacques-Louis David and Georges Roger between 1805 and 1807. Jacques-Louis David was a very influential painter during the revolutionary period. Uh, he's the one responsible for painting such paintings like the death of Marat, which you will see in the mix with the art for the French Revolutionary period. His domination over other nations unleashed the forces of nationalism, another ism. Nationalism in those countries which ultimately will result in his downfall fall, and yet another irony. He will inspire nationalism. Nationalism is a byproduct of the French Revolution. He delivers nationalism to those people. And ultimately, that nationalism will convince those people later on to rise against him and overthrow him as their ruler. Here's Napoleon on his imperial throne by Jacques Dominique Auguste Ingres from 1806. With all the trappings of being an emperor, you see laurel wreath on his head like the old Roman emperors, and you see the robes similar to what you would have seen on Louis XIV. The Grand Empire. Beginning in 1805, Napoleon engaged in constant warfare to gain territory. Eventually, Napoleon achieved the largest empire since Roman times though it was only temporary. France extended all the way to the Rhine River, including Belgium and Holland, or the Dutch Republic, also including the German coast to the Western Baltic, those territories were also taken by France, and the Italian coast extending down to Rome. More in a few slides about how he conquered all of this territory will be covered. Dependent satellite kingdoms where Napoleon took control or placed his appointees on the throne were as listed. The Confederation of the Rhine, Napoleon became its, quote, protector. His brother, Joseph Bonaparte, became king of Spain in 1808, placed on the throne by Napoleon himself. His youngest brother, Jerome, became king of Westphalia in Central Europe. His brother, Louis, was king of Holland for six years before Napoleon had him removed and incorporated Holland into France. Italy. His sister Caroline became queen of Naples. Lombardy, Venice, and the Papal States were ruled by his stepson. He abolished feudalism and reformed the social, political, and economic structures in Italy. He decided against creating a unified Italy as one kingdom, however, since he thought it might one day threaten his influence. Italy will not be unified as one nation until the middle of the 19th century. The Duchy of Warsaw in Poland was also part of his empire. The Illyrian provinces, which included uh, Trieste and the Dalmatian coast, were also part of his territory. Map, the administrative divisions of the first French empire are all labeled. Independent but allied states included Austria, Prussia, and Russia. They were independent, meaning they were not governed over by France, but they were basically, they had, were forced to become allies with him at different times. Um, to keep themselves from being conquered by him. All countries of the Grand Empire saw the introduction of some of the main principles of the French Revolution within their own territories, thus the spread of nationalism throughout Europe as a result of the Napoleonic Wars. The notable exception, there was no self-government through elective legislative bodies. 
that was not something that was enforced in those regions. Initially, Napoleon was supported by commercial and professional classes who supported the Enlightenment. Repression and exploitation, however, eventually turned his conquered territories against him. Conscription into the French army, meaning being drafted into the French army, was one big uh, pet peeve that they had. Higher taxes were also another problem that they had with him. While taxes in France were lowered, their taxes were increased to be part of his empire. They also resented the continental system that was put in place by Napoleon, which will be discussed later. The Enlightenment reformers believed Napoleon had betrayed the ideals of the revolution with these policies. And here is how he did it, how he conquered those territories. The War of the Third Coalition is where it begins. This is the phase between 1805 and 1807 of the Empire period. In 1803, it actually started the buildup for it when Napoleon began preparations to invade Britain. In 1805, Britain allied with Austria uh, when finding out about Napoleon's plans. The coalition was complete when Alexander I of Russia also joined in the alliance with Britain and Austria against Napoleon, all of them recognizing him as the larger threat to the balance of power in Europe. Napoleon's conquest of Italy, as I stated before, convinced Russia and Austria that he was a threat to that balance of power. The Battle of Trafalgar is the result of this, October 1805. The French and Spanish fleets, this is when Spain actually was part of the empire, it had been conquered by Napoleon already. The French and Spanish fleets were destroyed by the British Navy during this battle. Under, the British Navy was under the command of Lord Horatio Nelson. This battle took place off the Spanish coast. This established the supremacy of the British Navy for over a century. A French invasion of Britain was no longer feasible after this naval defeat for Napoleon. Though killed in battle, Horatio Nelson became one of the great military heroes in English history. And there is a square in London, Trafalgar Square, which in which a monument to Nelson has been erected. You can still visit it today. It's a very popular tourist spot in the middle of London. Here's a map of the Battle of Trafalgar. The death of Nelson took place in 1805. Another key battle of the Third Coalition was the Battle of Austerlitz in December of 1805. Tsar Alexander I pulled Russia out of the battle, giving Napoleon another major victory on land. The Russian forces did not have the military technology to compete with the French forces. Austria also suffered large territorial losses after this battle in return for making peace with France. The Third Coalition thus collapsed. Great Britain was successful against France at the Battle of Trafalgar, but the Battle of Austerlitz uh, brought a victory for France over Russia and Austria, collapsing the Third Coalition. Napoleon was now the master of both Western and Central Europe. In commemoration of his victory, Napoleon commissioned the famous Arc de Triomphe in 1806, which is still standing in the middle of Paris to this day on the Champs-Élysées. Though planning began in 1806, the Arc de Triomphe was actually not fully completed until the mid-1830s, long after Napoleon's defeat and his death. 
It stands now at the western end of the Champs-Élysées and it's a good example of the neoclassical style. This will be discussed more in the art of the French Revolution and Napoleonic phase. Audio lecture. Prussia was twice defeated by Napoleon in 1806 at the battles of both Jena and Alstad. Russia sought peace after another French victory in the spring of 1807. So Napoleon did very well on land, just not very well on water. The Treaty of Tilsit is the result of these victories, June 1807. The provisions. Prussia lost, lost half of its population in lands that it had to cede to France. Russia accepted Napoleon's reorganization of Western and Central Europe. And Russia agreed to Napoleon's continental system, which again will be discussed later. In many ways, the Treaty of Tilsit represented the height of Napoleon's success. Fran French and Russian empires became allies, mainly against Great Britain, as a result. Tsar Alexander I accepted Napoleon's domination of Western Europe. France continued to occupy Berlin and enjoyed increased control in Western Germany after conquering Prussia. The reorganization of Germany or the German territories after the defeat of Prussia. After soundly defeating the two most powerful and influential German states, Austria and Prussia, Napoleon will reorganize Germany, the central territories in Europe. He consolidated many of the nearly 300 independent political entities. Remember, Germany had been divided up into those 300 entities way back in 1648 after the Thirty Years' War. That was part of the Treaty of Westphalia. Instead, he created the Confederation of the Rhine. Fifteen German states, minus Austria, Prussia, and Saxony, were created, consolidating all of those little tiny territories into larger territories. Napoleon named himself Protector of the Confederation. Many tiny, tiny German states were abolished as a result. The Holy Roman Empire was abolished as well. Actually, it had already been abolished, but again, the idea of an emperor, uh, traditionally having been the ruler in Austria, that title was abolished. A new kingdom of Westphalia was created out of all Prussian territories west of the Elbe River and territories taken from Hanover. Serfdom was abolished and peasants now had the right to own land and move about freely. Napoleon unwittingly, however, awoke German nationalism due to France's domination and repression of the German states. We'll come back to haunt France later. Now, the continental system that we have been mentioning a few times, we need to discuss this now. Napoleon decided to wage economic warfare against Britain after his loss at the Battle of Trafalgar. Through shifting alliances, Britain had consistently maintained the balance of power against France. The Berlin Decree of 1806 um, resulted in Nap where Napoleon sought to starve Britain out by closing ports on the continent to British commerce. Since he controlled Berlin and he controlled these ports, he felt that if he could make them refuse to sell products to Great Britain, he could ultimately starve Great Britain into submission. The continental system was designed to try to get Britain to submit to him after the rest of Europe had. Napoleon coerced Russia, Prussia, and neutral Denmark and Portugal and Spain all to adhere to the boycott in the Treaty of Tilsit in 1807. England, in response, issued the, quote, order in council, 
neutrals might enter continental ports only if they first stopped in Great Britain. So neutral states would only be allowed to go into the continental territories if they wanted to maintain their trade ties with Great Britain if they stopped in Britain first. This way Great Britain could put goods on those other ships. Regulations encourage these ships to be loaded with British goods before continuing on to the continent. The British sought to strangle the French trade, not French imports of British goods. The Milan Decree of 1807, Napoleon's response to the order in council. Any neutral ship entering a British port or submitting to a British warship at sea would be confiscated by it if attempt, it attempted to enter a continental port. So it's like point counterpoint. Napoleon makes a move to hurt Great Britain. Great Britain makes a move to hurt France. France makes another move to hurt Britain and so on and so forth. The War of 1812 was actually part of this. The U.S. eventually declared war against Britain in defense of its neutral shipping rights. The United States wanted to continue to be able to trade with France, but the uh, rules that the British had put in place disallowed them from being able to do so, and this ultimately resulted in a war once again between the U.S. and Great Britain. The continental system ultimately was a major failure for Napoleon. It caused widespread antagonism to Napoleon's rule in Europe because they wanted to be able to get the goods that Great Britain could get to them. Great Britain's empire uh, had access to a lot of luxury items that the rest of Europe wanted and Great Britain by this point had industrialized. They were the first to industrialize and therefore those goods that Great Britain manufactured were desired all throughout Europe. So they resented that Napoleon would not allow them to have access to those goods through this continental system. So in actuality, starving out Great Britain was more so starving them out trade-wise or attempting to starve them out trade-wise and it flopped. It was a big flop for Napoleon. Imports from America were too much in demand in Europe and if Great Britain controlled those imports coming from America then the continental system was going to fail. European industries could not equal Britain's industrial output either so they needed British goods as well. Without railroads the continental system was impossible to maintain. Most of the railroads throughout the European continent, except for Great Britain, had not fully been built yet. Shippers, shipbuilders, and dealers in overseas goods, a powerful element of the older bourgeoisie, were ruined in result of this continental system. Eastern Europeans especially were hard hit as they had no industry and were dependent on imports from Great Britain and the United States. British made up lost trade with Europe by expanding exports into Latin America. Key concept. The Peninsular War, last phase, 1808 to 1814. The first great revolt against Napoleon's power occurred in Spain. When Napoleon tried to tighten his control over Spain by replacing the Spanish king with his brother Joseph, the Spanish people waged a costly guerrilla war against him. They received aid from the British under one of their ablest commanders, the Duke of Wellington. France suffered from Britain's counter blockade, resulting in the continental system's failure. Looking for a scapegoat, Napoleon turned to Tsar Alexander I of Russia, who had actually supported his blockade against Britain in the first place, but by this point he had left the continental system. Because he left the continental system, he was a, um, accused by Napoleon of making this be a loss for him. 
This is a painting by Francisco Goya, the 3rd of May, 1814. In this groundbreaking work, Goya commemorates the Spanish resistance to Napoleon's rule. Meanwhile, at home in France, things were also getting a little um, dicey. In 1810, Napoleon, now widowed from his first wife, married Marie Louise, an 18 year old daughter of the Austrian Emperor and the niece of Marie Antoinette. By marriage, Napoleon was now nephew of Louis XVI that had been beheaded, and he began to show more consideration to French noblemen of the old regime, those that had perhaps left France in the earlier phases of the revolution began to come back during this time period. Jacques-Louis David, again, Napoleon in his study, 1812, oil on canvas. This painting you can go see in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Back to the war. The Russian campaign. Napoleon invaded Russia in June of 1812 with his grand army of 600,000 men. This Russian campaign was in response to Alexander I pulling out of the continental system. Only one third of the forces that Napoleon entered Russia with were actually French. He conscripted most of these forces from those territories that he had conquered. The cause, as I said, was because Russia withdrew from the continental system due to economic hardships that it had caused within Russia. Napoleon However, once he invaded Russia, it was very difficult for him to get the Russians to engage in battles. They could trade space for time. As he moved into Russia, they continued to retreat. And Napoleon ultimately will move into territories as the Russians retreat, they will scorch the earth the Russians actually scorched their own earth and uh, to try to make it harder for Napoleon to um, uh, take over territories. Napoleon had a hard time feeding his forces as they entered Russia because the scorched earth tactics meant that there was nothing for the French forces to resupply themselves or eat food off of. Ultimately, the Russians had the advantage, even though they were militarily um, uh, lacking in technology. They could trade space for time and force Napoleon's forces to come deeper into Russia. Uh, they were all the way to Moscow within five weeks, and then the brutal Russian winter set in. The Russian winter is always always the best uh, the best weapon that the Russians have. If they could force Napoleon to um, be there when the Russian winter set in, they knew he would be defeated, not by military might, but by the Russian winter. The Russians evacuated, then burned Moscow themselves, refusing to negotiate with Napoleon knowing that he would have to retreat once the winter set in. The burning of Moscow, September 1812. Napoleon was forced to retreat. He was not going to be able to take over Russia. Only 30,000 men in Napoleon's army returned to their homelands. Remember, he entered with 600,000 men. That means that over half a million men died in the process of him trying to take over Russia. The invasion of Russia was the beginning of the end for Napoleon. Others will attempt the same thing later on in history and face the same kind of defeat. The Russian winter is their best weapon. We'll see the same thing happen with Hitler later on in World War II. 400,000 died of battle casualties, starvation, and exposure. 
Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, and many of them will die in the process. Napoleon raced home to raise another army, while Austria and Prussia now deserted Napoleon as, quote, allies. They were forced allies, remember, and joined Russia and Great Britain in a now newly rejuvenated fourth coalition against him. The brutal Russian winter of 1812 to 1813 destroyed much of Napoleon's army as it retreated back to France. The War of the Fourth Coalition, 1813 to 1814. Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia versus France. The Battle of Leipzig, also known as the Battle of Nations, took place in October 1813. Napoleon was finally defeated by the coalition. Napoleon lost another 500,000 of his 600,000 grand army that he had raised for this battle. It was the largest battle in world history until the 20th century. Napoleon refused to accept the terms of the Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich's Frankfurt for proposals at the end of this battle to reduce France to its historical size in return for him remaining on the throne as emperor. He refused and therefore he would continue to fight and he would continue to lose. The Quadruple Alliance was then created in March of 1814. Each power agreed to provide 150,000 soldiers to enforce peace terms on Napoleon after they defeated him. Napoleon was forced to abdicate as emperor on April 4, 1814 after Allied armies entered Paris and forced him to surrender. The Bourbons were restored to the throne and the son of, sorry, the brother of Louis XVI who had been living in exile since the early phase of the French Revolution will ascend to the throne and he will become known as King Louis XVIII. Just a little an aside here, there was never a Louis XVII. He took the number 18 out of respect for the son of Louis XVI who died in prison during the revolution and would never become king. The Charter of 1814 was uh, um, the result of Louis XVIII coming to the throne. The king, Louis XVIII, created a two-house legislature that rep was represented only by the upper classes. So all of what had been accomplished during the French Revolution was not completely abandoned. They did finally get their constitutional monarchy that they had wanted from the beginning. Unfortunately, we had to go through that reign of terror, Republican period, and Napoleonic period before we could actually get to it, and many, many deaths in the process. It was the first constitution in European history issued by a monarch. The constitution in Great Britain was not issued by the monarch, it was issued by the parliament. The restoration of the Bourbon dynasty maintained most of Napoleon's reforms domestically, such as the Code Napoleon and the Concordat with the Pope and the abolition of feudalism. The first Treaty of Paris, which we know really is the third Treaty of Paris because we've already had one in 1763 and one in 1783. Um, this Treaty of Paris from 1814 was uh, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, or at least the first end of the Napoleonic Wars. France surrendered all territory that it had gained since the wars of the revolution had begun in 1792. Allied powers imposed no indemnity or reparations after now that uh, Louis XVIII had refused to pay. <laughs> Louis um, um, the 18th will remain on the throne and Napoleon was exiled instead of killed. He was exiled to the island of Elba as a sovereign with an income from France. Now you might be wondering why the European coalition did this. 
A lot of it had to do with the fact that Napoleon, with his control of the press back at home in France for so many years, had quite the goodwill of the people with him, and they still loved him. Napoleon was a superstar in the eyes of his people. And so if they had killed him, they were concerned that would ultimately um, cause a huge, massive rebellion. And at, from, at this point, the uh, leaders of Europe were tired of fighting and they did not want to have to put down yet another, quote, French Revolution. So they allowed him to abdicate. They allowed him to be exiled to the island of Elba and receive an income from France rather than kill him. Elba was not far enough away, as we will soon see. The Quadruple Alliance agreed to meet in Vienna, which will be the famous Congress of Vienna that we'll talk about in another lecture. They will meet there to work out a general peace settlement to restore the balance of power to Europe. The Hundred Days, March through June of 1815. Napoleon is not quite done. Napoleon capitalized on the stalled peace talks at Vienna and escaped the island of Elba, which was just in the Mediterranean Sea off the coastline of France, and returned to France victorious in March of 1815. This ushered in what was known as the Hundred Days. It began on March 1st, 1815, when Napoleon landed in the south of France and marched with large-scale popular support into Paris. He seized power from Louis XVIII, who fled Paris once again. Napoleon raised an army quickly and then defeated a Prussian army in Belgium in June of, of 1815, June 16th, 1815. He was going to reconquer all those territories he had lost, or so he thought. Napoleon's return from Elba. Popular support back at home. However, he will be stopped at the Battle of Waterloo, June 1815. This will be the last battle of the Napoleonic Wars. Thank heavens. Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, Belgium, by England's army led by the Duke of Wellington and Prussian forces. Napoleon, this time, was captured and exiled once again, but this time to the South Atlantic island of St. Helena, far off the coast of Africa, where he eventually will die in 1821. Boom! Napoleon is dead before Christmas for AP European history. Yes, we did it, folks. Boom. The quote second, it's actually like the fourth, Treaty of Paris, 1815, finally ends the Napoleonic Wars, like for realsies this time. This was where the Quadruple Alliance now dealt harshly with France in subsequent negotiations at the Congress of Vienna. And once again, Louis XVIII returned to the throne in France. It contained minor changes to the borders previously agreed to. France had to pay an indemnity or a, a reparations, war reparations of 700 million francs for the loss of life. So let's talk about Napoleon's rule. Let's evaluate Napoleon's rule. In reality, there were some good things to go along with the bad things. It's the first egalitarian dictatorship of modern times. Egalitarian meaning equal. I know that sounds like a contradiction in terms, egalitarian dictatorship. But in reality, since he's a paradox anyways, it makes sense. There were some positive achievements. The revolutionary institutions that had been initiated in France during the revolution were cons consolidated and kept. The French government was thoroughly centralized. He made a lasting settlement with the church that will create peace, religious peace or religious toleration for a long time. So he spread positive uh, um, achievements of the French Revolution to the rest of Europe as well, including that nationalism. In the impact on other countries, 
Serfdom was abolished in much of the German, Germany territories by 1807 because they were under Napoleon's rule at that point. Germany was reorganized into 39 states instead of 300 small states. Prussia and Austria, for self-preservation, reformed their militaries and provided some reforms of their own so they could try to, you know, uh, combat Napoleon over time. Liabilities of his rule. He repressed individual liberty, even though he promoted um, com community liberty, meaning nationalism. He repressed individual liberty. He subverted republicanism. And he oppressed conquered peoples throughout Europe. He saw himself as a liberator and he gave them, quote, French revolutionary ideas to base their new governments on. But in reality, he's insisting that they follow the model that he dictates to them for those new governments. He caused terrific suffering as a result of the wars that he initiated all throughout Europe and much loss of life 